Welcome to the Braver Angels podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm your host, Kieran O'Connor. Today I'm releasing a conversation I had about three weeks ago with Lawrence Lessig. Lawrence is a noted academic, activist, professor at Harvard Law School, and someone who ran for president in 2016. Lawrence and I had a wide-ranging conversation. We discussed the underlying structures that have deepened polarization in our society. We discussed how the profit incentives in our media ecosystem have evolved to enforce division rather than communicate a shared reality. We talked about political corruption and how it's degraded our expectations for our leaders to the point that even the most brazen forms of self-dealing have come to be seen as sadly par for the course. But we ended on an inspirational note, and we talked about how we can move from a politics of hate to a politics of love. I really enjoyed this conversation. Lawrence is an incredible mind and very grateful to him for coming on the podcast. I hope you like it too. You can shoot me any feedback at media at braverangels.org. And without further ado, I give you Lawrence Lessig. Lawrence Lessig, welcome to the podcast. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. So one of the things we do at Braver Angels when we try to bring people together to better understand each other's perspectives is we try to draw out their own ideological evolution, particularly in terms of lived experiences, because we find that that helps people relate. It's a lot harder to invalidate someone's lived experience than it is to counter with a partisan talking point. So I wanted to give you an opportunity just to kick us off to sort of talk about your own ideological evolution. I did some reading about you and read that, you know, as a youngster, you may have considered yourself a little bit more conservative. You participated in the teenage Republicans. And then over time, as you went to Cambridge, you started becoming a little bit more progressive. Most recently, you obviously launched a bid for the Democratic nomination for president. But in some ways, some might say that you've retained some libertarian views. So I guess it'd be interesting to just talk to our viewers a little bit about what's been your own ideological path and what are some of the seminal experiences you've had and and the people you've been around that have sort of shaped the the tapestry of your current view of politics and how we can relate to one another in American society. Yeah, so I grew up in the Kentucky part of Pennsylvania. So that's the center of Pennsylvania, which is an extremely conservative part of the state. My parents were Republicans. I was a Republican. My dad was an um, entrepreneur, owned a steel fabricating business. And, you know, so I was coming to age in the late, um, uh, well, I guess the early 70s. I was born in 61. Um, and I think the conception we had of politics, or I had of politics, was driven largely by my father, who was a man of extraordinary integrity and uh, a man who believed in the free market system and the, and the virtues of uh, economic liberty. And so what was de- defining, what was dis- distinctive about that moment was that the Democratic Party at that time seemed to be a party, not of ideas, seemed to be a party of kind of corrupt status quoism. It didn't seem to have much that it was pushing that was of any interest. And I remember being swept up by people like Bill Buckley um, and the, re, you know, the intellectual uh, um, uh, thoughts of, uh, you know, Hayek. And, you know, when I was a kid, I was obsessed with Ayn Rand. So all of that kind of built a libertarianism in my own thinking. But it was more than libertarianism. It was a kind of principled integrity that seemed to entail libertarianism. And so... You know, I was a chairman of the Teenage Republicans of Pennsylvania. I ran to be a deleg- uh, member of the Pennsylvania delegation in the 1980 Republican Convention, the youngest member in that convention. Mm. Um, and uh, um, in 1980, I ran a, a campaign. Uh, I ran a state senate campaign in Erie, Pennsylvania which I'm so happy I lost because um, had I won, you know, that probably would have been my life. I probably would have gone off and been a right-wing 
political campaign manager, who knows, uh, you know, kind of um, within that world of, uh, of uh, ideologues. Um, uh, but de- being, being defeated or losing pretty dramatically kind of forced me back to first principles. I graduated from college. I went to Cambridge. I studied philosophy. My tutor was a libertarian, a Christian libertarian. Um, and through the course of that thinking about the about libertarianism, what I came to recognize is that what was important was having a society where liberty was possible. Mm. You couldn't just take for granted that liberty was possible. You know, Soviet societies, you couldn't have liberty. It's because of the society. Um, you know, you live starving in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the uh, uh, forest. You can't have liberty because you're constantly seeking food or shelter or protection. What you need is societies that enable people to have liberty. And that began my shift in thinking from focusing not so much directly on whether we got the thing that we wanted, which was liberty, but more, how do we build the environment, the society that makes that liberty possible? Um, And in that sense, I don't think I've ever changed. I feel like my politics has always been focused on that question. It's just the world around that question has changed. So the Democratic Party is not now the party of no ideas. I think the Democratic Party is filled with people who have incredible ideas like um, Andrew Yang driving for universal basic income as a way, in my own view, to create the conditions within which liberty would be possible. Um, uh, you know, I think the fights for single payer health care about removing the kind of constraint that makes it so people can't flourish, can't have an opportunity to flourish because they're terrified about, you know, uh, uh, getting sick and then not able to uh, take care of their health care. And, and interestingly, the Republican Party has evolved to being what it felt to me like the Democratic Party was when I was 18. You know, I don't know where the ideas are in the Republican Party anymore. I, I, don't, I, I don't know what the integrity of, the, of at least the Trump part of the party is anymore. So um, I, I don't so much feel like I've changed my mind as I, as I, as I believe that I've come to have a a more complete, I wouldn't say deeper, I don't want to make it sound, you know, too highfalutin. I just, I feel like it's a more complete understanding of what's necessary to make it possible for people to have the kind of liberty we should be protecting and supporting. And that's led to support many more programs aimed at achieving that kind of society uh, where such liberty is possible. Hmm. That's very interesting. And I think a useful lens to think about some of your work and how it might apply to some of the things that we focus on. Um, You know, as I think you know, we're very concerned about the growing polarization, tribalization, siloization in our society that makes it harder for us to move forward and harder for us to achieve a more liberal, more just society. You focused a lot of your work on potential democratic reforms, electoral reform, campaign finance reform. How do you see these systems as they relate to polarization? Because we think about polarization a lot of times in terms of affective polarization, how I feel about you based on your political preferences. But there's also these bigger undergirding structures in terms of how our politics is situated that can enforce the polarization or that can ameliorate the polarization. So how do you think about that issue in terms of where you've been focused um, and how these systems might be currently influencing polarization? And then maybe we can talk a little bit about what we might be able to do about it. Okay, so the core idea is the business model of hate. Hmm. You gotta keep that idea at the center. Um, So I I just wrote a, published a book called They Don't Represent Us. One half of it is about how the government doesn't represent us because of things like gerrymandering, money in politics, the Electoral College, all these systems of democracy that produce a democracy that does not give citizens equal political power inside of the system. But the second half of the book is, um, is about how we don't represent us. And what that's about is the way media infrastructure has developed to um, separate us and to polarize us um, and to make us um, ignorant in different ways. Um, and, and what's striking about both of those failures is that both of them are driven by the business model of hate. 
Um, because the business model of hate is profitable in both environments. Let's st start with the media environment. You know, there's this amazing moment in the history of modern media when Roger Ailes is um, being brought aboard Fox News. And at that moment, Fox News just conceives of itself as a kind of uh, edgy, tabloid-like television news show, but no different in its purpose from, you know, Walter Cronkite's uh, conception of the news. They were going to cover the news. They were going to cover as much as they could. They were going to try to attract the widest audience they could. But Roger Ailes tells him, no, 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 that's a mistake. What you need to do is you need to focus on a niche, on a base, and you need mm. to nurture that base, and you need to convince them that you speak for them. <coughs> and that's the birth of cable news. Um, because what Roger Ailes recognized is that the business model of polarization was incredibly profitable. And there's, uh, in, in the book, I, I reproduce this extraordinary graph that kind of marks the ideological content of C uh, CNN, Fox, and MSNBC. And what it shows is that until around 2000, they're not really very different. Like they hadn't quite figured out how to differentiate themselves. But beginning with 9-11, you begin to see Fox News veer to the right and MSNBC veer to the left and CNN kind of bouncing in between trying to find its own niche. But all three of them realizing that the way they make money is to build these worlds that are separate from each other. And they feed their audience a story that reinforces the audience's own view of themselves and their audience's view of the enemy. That's the politics of hate. They profit from this business model of making the other side the enemy and making themselves feel virtuous in their crusade against the enemy. And of course, the internet just does that even more efficiently. When you look at the business model of advertising um, on Facebook, like when Facebook turns on advertising in the context of the news feed, what that advertising is doing is trying to rile you up, get you angry and engaged, to get you furious. And the way it gets you furious is by calling out the enemy and calling them the enemy and making them seem like ridiculous, absurd people who need to be suppressed or pushed off the face of the earth. And that's because it makes them more money. I mean, this is what's so bizarre. It's not because you've got people ideologically committed. Right. They might be committed. That makes it easier for them to work there. What they're committed to, though, is making money. And that business model turns out to be um, the most effective business model to make money, even though it's the most effective business model for destroying the capacity for common understanding. Now, when you take it into the context of politics, it's the same story, the first part, that kind of they don't represent us. Because, you know, when we have a system for funding campaigns that says campaigns will be privately funded. And what that means is that politicians have to spend anywhere between 30 and 70% of their time raising money to fund their campaigns or to get their party back into power. Okay, so what's the most efficient business model for fundraising? It's the politics of hate. Like you know that if you uh, can rile up your base and convince them that the other side is the devil, they're more likely to send you money than if you send them an email that says, geez, we've been working hard and we're doing good and we've all these great ideas for making the world a better place. That kind of message, the positive message, turns out to do worse than the negative, hateful message. And so this drive to raise money drives people to be increasingly antagonistic, increasingly polarized, because that's the most efficient way to raise money. So what's bizarre is, in both contexts, the poison is the byproduct of a business model. And the business model wasn't given to us by God. It wasn't given to us by the framers of the Constitution. It's just what we've tripped into and nobody's like paused to say, wait a minute, maybe we shouldn't be distributing news in a way that makes it more profitable to make us the more ignorant. I mean, you know, maybe we ought to be distributing news in a platform or in a business model where more understanding is more profitable and less understanding is less profitable. But we've mm -hmm. done exactly the opposite. And I think that's the core source of this, you know, incredible um, separation between audiences about um, – about what, in fact, is the truth about the nature of the problems we face. 
Right. Would you see the 2008 Obama campaign as potentially a counterpoint to that argument, a campaign that was actually able to be successful by driving a message of hope and unity? I mean, obviously, they were also drawing that contrast starkly with the Bush administration. But I just wonder, I worked for the president in 2012 on his reelection campaign, and I noticed that in a lot of his speeches, he did try to embrace the language of better angels, especially when you consider it in contrast to what you see now. How genuine do you think that is? Or do you think that even Obama was really running on this conflictual frame that appeals to our emotions so strongly? Well, I think that um, Obama, you know, comes into the presidency um, quite, uh, it's almost as if God had intervened. I mean, you know, the collapse of 2008, the September collapse of 2008 was a critical cause to his ultimate victory. It's not clear what would have happened if they're, you know, if they'd sailed through with no, you know, financial crisis in 2008. Um, right. Because, you know, I mean, Barack uh, it was a friend. Uh, we were colleagues at University of Chicago. I supported every one of his campaigns. Um, but he was running against John McCain, you know, and John McCain was an incredibly credible, um, uh, not crazy uh, Republican. And it's not clear, that, you know, the odds were in favor of Obama, but it's not clear it would have turned out that way. So I think that he comes in without having, uh, actually having to play this game. Um, mm. But um, when he gets there, you know, I think he makes a critical mistake. Rather than, you know, I, everybody kind of has a sense at the inauguration, the man walked on water. He was, he was above it all. But rather than, like, embracing that way of understanding who he was and what his administration could be, he kind of stepped down off the pedestal and took up the mantle of the leader of the Democratic Party. And... Um, immediately made it plausible for the Republicans to say our single purpose, as Mitch McConnell said, is to make sure that he's a one-term president. Right. So very early on, driven by racism, no doubt, but very early on, the, can the whole character of the fight becomes an essentially partisan fight at every stage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the, the Republicans, of course, are out of power for the first two years because the Democrats have an effective, not complete supermajority, but close to it. But then 2010, they blew it. And, you know, from that moment on, the politics of hate profits enormously. And the other important thing is, whatever the high-mindedness of Barack Obama, Fox News was printing money by rendering that uh, administration in a completely partisan way and them playing to the partisan uh, politics of hate that I'm describing. And that's that, you know, they were flourishing at that point because they could, they could build on and see this kind of latent anxiety, insecurity among white, uh, uh, especially white men about, you know, the idea of this African-American president. Um, but also the kind of fear of like what it was going to mean to have this quote radical, of course, never really, never at all a radical, but this radical as president, which began to foment the ideas of the Tea Party, which of course then in 2010 became so successful. So I, I think that he, you're right that he framed the campaign originally in that way, but that didn't allow anybody to escape the most profitable business model for politics or for media, because you know, we saw they were swallowed by that profitable business model and nothing changed. Right. So given the profitability of vitriol and the approach we see on cable news, which is seemingly destined to pit us against one another, what are some potential reforms in your view that if successfully realized could change the incentives and could get us to a place where we might actually be able to work together where we do agree. Well, I, it, this is really hard. Um, it's really hard first because, you know, there's, there's no obvious thing that the government can do, at least in America, because of the way the First Amendment has been interpreted. But I think that the useful analog to understand this problem is to think about food, right? So 
we all have this awareness of um, healthy eating and unhealthy eating, and we all have this understanding that there's this industry out there, um, food science. Uh, it's kind of a bastardization of the concept of science, but what food science does is it looks at how they can engineer food to make them the most addictive, make the food the most addictive it can be. So what's the right, right salt, fat, sugar mixture to make it so you can't resist it, right? So if I give you 30 uh, cupcakes and you sat down in front of a movie, you would not eat 30 cupcakes. You might eat one or two. Um, but if I gave you a bag of perfectly engineered potato chips, you couldn't stop yourself. Or the same thing with certain kind of popcorn. You can't stop yourself. And you can't because these scientists have learned how to exploit evolution. Like your brain and your body has evolved to a place and they can figure out the right tweak to make it so you can't stop. Well, that's the same thing that's happening in the context of media. What's happened, especially in the context of the internet, is that they've figured out how to tweak the mixture of reward and incentive and insecurity and, um, and uh, confidence um, and bottomless pits of content and all of this, these devices that trade on our psychological nature to make you, uh, make it impossible for you to resist the consumption of this media. And doesn't really matter what's on the media from their perspective. What's important to them is just that you participate so that they learn more about you. And the more they learn about you, the easier it is for them to sell efficient advertising to you. So it's the business model of advertising, driving them to force you to reveal everything you can about yourself. And then they use that to make the advertising better. Now, the point about it is that um, you're, you know, just like uh, you're not going to be able to resist the potato chip. Like the strategy for the potato chip is just not to buy them or to not have them in the television room or to lock them in the basement and require going down to the basement to get them. Like all of these <laughs> indirect techniques to make sure you're not exposed to the potato chip. It's the same thing in this media environment. We need to think, you know, in the food environment, there's this thing called the slow food movement. Right. It says, look, if we just, if you just commit to cooking your food, you can't poison yourself with, with food you cook, like in the same way that processed food is poisoned. It's just too hard to make good process, to make processed food like quality at home. So if you cook, you're going to cook healthy food. You'll eat the right amount of it. You'll eat it slowly if you sit down with friends and you talk to them over dinner. And that the byproduct of eating in that way will give you the nutrition you need to survive. We need the equivalent in democracy space. We need a slow democracy movement. We need to recognize what about us as humans makes us vulnerable to certain kinds of speech and what kind of speech actually helps us think through issues of democracy better. So we should know that Twitter and Facebook are like junk food for uh, politics. They make us crazy. They don't help, understand, help us understand things. They help us misunderstand things. They help us become these isolated, polarized, hate-driven hate, uh, uh, Americans. Um, and so we should, we should consume less of that. Like if you're getting your news from your Facebook news feed, you're the problem. You got to turn it off. You got to stop getting your news from the Facebook news feed. And instead you need to turn on to sources of media that, um, that the human uh, psychology can process well. So for example, um, podcasts. You know, so podcasts are extended conversations by humans talking to humans um, about complicated ideas in a way that helps map the full range of the idea. You know, 50,000 years of evolution have brought us to the place where we can listen to conversations. That's what we do as humans well. Um, and if it's in, a, it's in the right environment, we're not distracted by a million things, or we have a way to focus and listen, um, we can be brought into a subject in a really mature and informed way. And at the end of that process, we haven't been rendered into crazy um, uh, tribal uh, uh, activists. We've been educated. We've been informed. We've been, you know, made better people uh, about an issue. Not because we've been more liberal or more conservative. 
we just understand it better. Um, and so I think that, you know, podcast reform of speech that is really good for democracy. I think narrative form of speech, you know, you think of some of the great television series that we now have access to um, that can tell, you know, these things that are, you know, effectively 40 hour long movies, um, um, which you know, tell complicated stories on all sides. You know, a lot of, there was a lot of controversy about the series Homeland, especially early on, and lots of criticism about how it characterized everything. But I think that's a really uh, uh, narrow and short circuit, uh, a short sighted view of it, because what Homeland did was kind of meet America where it was. And then it carried America to a deeper, mm. richer understanding of those issues than any professor could have ever brought them. It's not like if you had, you know, put a professor on television and had them lecture to America for, you know, seven seasons. Uh, it would have had a millionth of the effect in bringing a richer understanding of these issues that uh, that uh, Homeland did. Um, and so I think we should just recognize, like, another thing we've become good at in 50,000 years of evolution is listening to stories, like understanding narrative and how it works and like empathizing along the way. There's an amazing um, Apple TV series called The Morning Show, I think, um, you know, but it was about um, sexual uh, uh, assault and sexual um, uh, harassment in the workplace. Um, and Steve Carroll and, uh, um, was the kind of vi uh, villain in, this, in the story. Um, it, it could address those issues in a way that nobody could have addressed directly, right? Steve Carroll, as the bad guy, could give a speech that actually said things that many people understood and kind of believed, but would never say out loud uh, because of the fear of like retaliation. But because he was inside of a narrative form, he could express these ideas and they could live and be reflected on in a, in a full and, and, and meaningful way because it was inside narrative. And so I think narrative is a part of slow democracy movement. I think, I think comedy is a part of slow democracy movement, right? When you, even if you're listening to a, you know, a comedian who's like the opposite of your politics, and he says something and you laugh, even if you disagree with his politics, you're laughing because you get it. You get the point. Mm -hmm. You might not agree, but you see, okay, I see how people see that. And, and so all of these are strategies for helping us think more seriously about really hard issues recognizing that we need to do it in the right context, not in the context which turns us into crazy people. And then recognizing that 90% of po political speech is channeled into these contexts that turn us into crazy people. And we have to find a way to fight that and resist that. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a fascinating perspective. And when it comes to changing habits of consumption, there's definitely some encouraging news there, you know, with the rise of podcasts, longer conversations, longer form narratives. When it comes to political structures, uh, you mentioned, for example, the Electoral College before, which has become a very polarized issue. What specifically would you like to see as reforms in the Electoral College? Yeah, I, I, I think this is a great example of... Um, the ethics of citizenship. Um, mm. You know, the ethics of citizenship means thinking about problems in a way that acknowledges the other side. So, you know, if, if I just walked into the question of the Electoral College without thinking about Republicans at all, I would say, abolish it. Let's just have national popular vote. This is ridiculous. Right. Um, but if I credit Republicans as citizens, as equally part of our tradition, um, then I think, well, you know, maybe we need a solution that doesn't so directly reject the views that they bring to the story, the legitimate views. I mean, I don't think anybody who has as an objective the suppression of the votes of people they don't agree with uh, has a legitimate view. I think that's illegitimate. So I'm not saying every view of the other side or our side is legitimate by definition, but I am saying there are certain views about the Electoral College from Republicans that are very legitimate, like it's a product of federalism. It's a product of like encouraging a diversity among systems for, uh, for, for voting or selecting electors in different states. So if you don't reject that out of hand, then what kind of solution would make sense? Well, I, I actually think there is a solution that um, both Democrats and Republicans should be able to, should be able to like celebrate and agree on as 
much better than the current system. So this is an attempt to practice the politics of love as opposed to the politics of hate, a politics that says we can find common ground and celebrate that common ground, as opposed to I'm going to build the biggest army I can so I can crush you and everybody like you. Um, and so that, that's, that solution starts by recognizing what is the problem with the college everybody should agree is a problem. And in my view, that problem is the consequence of winner take all in the way states allocate electors. So states mm -hmm. allocate their electors according to the winner of the popular vote. So if you are in California and you get 50% plus one, you get every one of California's 55 electoral votes. All right, so what's the consequence of that? Well, the consequence for any political campaign is you never spend a dime in any state that is not a swing state. Like no Republican spends any money in California or in Texas because every Republican knows it's a waste of money to spend money in California or Texas. You, there's no reason to spend it in California. You're never going to win. There's no reason to spend it in Texas because you already are going to win. There's nothing to be gained from spending money in Texas. So that means the only states where candidates spend any time or any money are the so-called swing states. In 2016, there were 14. They saw 99% of campaign spending, 95% of campaign appearances. In 2020, there will probably be nine swing states. Um, everybody, every other swing state doesn't matter. And what the consequence of that is, is that presidential politics drives, uh, presidential policies are driven to benefit the swing states and screw the other states. Because you don't care about the other states, you care about the swing states. So there's so many policies. When you look at them, you say, why is this America's policy? It's obvious when you look at swing state politics. So, you know, subsidizing the production of ethanol. No sane government would ever do that except for Iowa right. or steel tariffs. Why would we have steel tariffs? Oh, Pennsylvania, right? So you can take basically every stupid policy we've adopted and tie it back to this ridiculous system for electing the president. Um, and it's a system that objectively 41 states are worse off because of that system than, than an alternative. Well, that's an enormous opportunity because if 41 states are made worse off by a system, you only need 38 of them to agree and you have got an amendment that could fix it, right? Because 38 states are necessary to pass an amendment. Okay, so what could this amendment be? Well, the amendment would say, we're not gonna get rid of the electoral college. We are gonna get rid of electors. So we're gonna say every state gets a certain number of electoral votes. Um, and then the law says, then the constitutional amendment says, those electoral votes have to be divided proportionally between the top two vote getters at a fractional level. So if you get 45% of the vote in Montana as a Democrat, you get one point, you know, I don't remember, four, two or some percent, uh, one, two, 1. 1.42 electoral votes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the point is fractional electoral votes then uh, are allocated in every state to the top two vote getters however the state decides to determine the top two vote getters. So some states could use ranked choice, others could use approval, others could just say whoever the top two vote getters are. You divide them proportionally, and then you add up who got uh, 270 electoral votes or more um, in this proportional way. Now, the first thing that does out of the gate is it makes every state relevant to the presidential election. You don't care if you're a president getting votes in California or in Texas or in Kentucky or in Montana. Every vote's a vote. But it is true, as the one person, one vote people would say, that every vote's not equal. California voters have less voting power per capita than Wyoming does. Okay, that's true. This is a compromise with the old system. But here's the, here's the opportunity about that compromise. If you take the bottom 10 states, Five of them are red and five of them are blue. So it's a compromise, but it has no partisan advantage behind it. It's a mm. compromise with our tradition that says we're going to give an advantage to smaller states. But you could say, well, that's just the price of federalism. We give the advantage to smaller states. But it's not going to skew the political results. And if it doesn't skew the political results, then what's the problem with accepting that compromise? And so I think that you can see through, this, through these steps the the opportunity for an amendment that objectively Republicans and Democrats in 41 states ought to support 
if they can be brought to understand why. And if you could imagine a movement that succeeded in getting a constitutional amendment passed that would address the Electoral College, that would seem like the most powerful democratic movement we've seen since the civil rights bills of the 1960s. I mean, that would be an extraordinary success. But I think it's completely feasible when you, when you discipline yourself to follow the politics of love as opposed to the politics of hate. And you think, what can we do to make that possible as opposed to what can we do to kill our enemy? Yeah, I think that's very well stated. Um, Because my follow up question was actually going to be, you know, what are the aspects of conservative opposition to electoral reform that you find to be legitimate? And you tackled that right off the bat and said that, you know, it's important to recognize the credibility and legitimacy of certain arguments, because if you just come into the argument as a liberal and just say national popular vote, it's going to shut things down and people are going to think you're just coming in for partisan advantage. Right. And I think you see that on both sides. So I think that was, you know, very in keeping with what we do at Braver Angels. Um, the last question I wanted to ask you while I have you is about the nature of corruption and political corruption in particular, because I know it's something that you've thought a lot about. How have you seen this issue evolve over the course of the last four years in particular, how concerned are you about the normalization of sort of what some might see of brazen forms of corruption? And do you think that we can pull back from that? Or do you think that it's become so normalized that people have become so cynical that essentially the argument that's going to win out is, well, you know, we need to do it too, or we're just unilaterally disarming. How do you think things are going to go? Obviously, it depends on who wins in November. But how do you see this issue um, more largely? And what might be the ways that we could incentivize better behavior instead of more corrupt behavior? Well, you know, four years ago, the debate about corruption was a debate about a very subtle conception of corruption. You know, so... um, Peter Schweitzer wrote this attack book on Hillary Clinton, I think called Clinton Cash. And and the argument of that book is that the Clintons were leveraging their influence in politics to drive support for their private foundation. And as a byproduct, they got to live the the high life as they, you know, could leverage money for their speeches and so forth. Um, Or selling access, essentially. Yeah, selling access, right. And... You know, in some sense, you want to say, okay, there's something to that. There's a reason to be concerned about that. There there is something corrupting about that. But on the other side, you know, what they would say is, what we're doing is building a foundation that are helping people, you know, deal with AIDS in Africa. Like, what? so what? Like, what's the wrong to it? So it was a subtle debate, but I was very strongly on the side that government should never be perceived to be selling access. It should never be the case that people believe that, what's being decided is being decided for anything other than the right reasons. And the whole right. system, the whole economy of influence that had developed um, uh, inside the Democratic Party and the Republican Party was corrupt, not in a traditional criminal sense of bribery. There's none of bribery here. But in a deeper, more fundamental institutional sense, it was corrupt because it meant the institution was not responding in the way it was designed to respond um, to, you know, fundamental interests. You know, the pre- Barack Obama, I, I, you know, I feel like lost such an opportunity with this issue um, and, and then went back on it in some ways. You know, when he ran in 2008, he, he made the explicit promise he was never going to give out ambassadorships on the basis of like who gave the most money to his campaign. And then, oops, except he did, right? Um, and that too is exactly that kind of grotesque kind of uh, corruption that four years ago I would have said is the most important kind of corruption to worry about. Well, you know, what a difference four years makes <laughs> because that's not the corruption anybody's talking about now. The corruption we're talking about now is the grossest form of self-dealing imaginable. And, you know, mm-hmm. what's astonishing is to see people like Peter Schweitzer, who was the great moralist four years ago, um, disappear. Like, he doesn't even write about, you know, the Trump corruption. Um, he's still yeah. trying to write about the Democrats' corruption. So it's, so, but the point is, like, when you've got a president who, for example, is intervening to stop the FBI from moving out of 
um, you know, the mall, away from the mall. They wanted to move to, to Virginia so that they could have a bigger building and cheaper rent. The president vetoes it, gets the White House to veto that move. Why? Because the J. Edgar Hoover building is across the street from the Trump Hotel. So if you move the J. Edgar, if you move the FBI out of Washington, you reduce the demand for beds at the Trump Hotel. The idea that the president is using the office of the White House to protect his uh, rental uh, property in the middle of Washington is a kind of corruption that I think is literally incomprehensible. I don't think any president, literally any president, was that base. I mean, you know, Harding had an administration filled with lots of people trying to take advantage of him. Um, I think, you know, poor General Grant uh, was a little bit too trusting of people around him, too. So you can see how presidents have, like, allowed corruption to occur, but they've never directly tried to leverage the office of president for their own personal economic gain. But this president has. And, and so I, I, I guess I'm not as worried, I guess I'd put it like this, I'm not as worried that the next president you know, might be tempted to do the same thing. I, I just think this president's pathological. I don't, I don't think it's a, it's a new strategy. I just think it's path, pathology. He doesn't even get it. He doesn't even see why it's wrong. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, that's just a reflection of something wrong in his own head, not something wrong about his party. What I fear is that if we can just eliminate that corruption, people are going to be like, oh, you know, everything's great. There's no corruption to worry about. So we'll go back to the old world of right. like influence. the overton window has yes. shifted a little yeah. bit and we'll feel good about ourselves even though we're selling ambassadorships and you know the only way you get to speak to the president is if you've bundled 10 million dollars for his campaign so I, I i think there's a real fight to make sure that the next administration assuming it's not a continuation of this one um uh you know sets the bar for corruption reform extremely high and, and here's where there's something depressing about how this has evolved. You know, we over the last uh, uh, year and a half working with Represent Us and, um, and Citizens United have had a concerted campaign to get every candidate running for president to commit to fundamental democracy reform, corruption reform in their first 100 days in office. And that would be basically take what was H.R. 1, which is, you know, public funding for congressional elections, gerrymandering reform, voting rights uh, reform, ethics reform, bundle it together and commit to get that or something better than that passed in the first 100 days. We succeeded in getting every single candidate, leading candidate in the, uh, in the Democratic primary to commit to that, except Joe Biden. Um, mm. and, and of course, then, you know, when Joe Biden become the presumptive nominee, this movement, you know, is, I think, wounded in a significant way. And I think it would be an, a, a very important for Biden right now to embrace this ideal, to speak to not just getting away from the Trump corruption, but getting towards an ideal of integrity that, um, you know, many people saw Clinton as not living up to. And, and, you know, I think we need to be better than just not Trump. We have to be the, an ideal that people could rally to, whether they're on the left or the right, they could agree we need to drain the swamp. Here's a real swamp draining idea. Let's get a government that cares about the right thing as opposed to which thing raises the most cash. Gotcha. Well, the last question, granting that much of the developments have been depressing and discouraging, what signs of hope do you see in the democracy reform movement, particularly when it comes to maybe the younger generation, because I know you teach and interact with young people. I think the most exciting examples of reform have all been examples that play on the politics of love. Um, so Katie Fahey in Michigan, who, you know, 20 something posts a Facebook post after the last election says, I want to work on gerrymandering reform. Anybody interested? And within a couple months, she has 4,000 volunteers they raise, they, they get hundreds of thousands of signatures on a ballot petition, a $12 million campaign later, they have succeeded in passing gerrymandering reform in Michigan. But what's critical about that movement was that early on, Katie adopted a militant attitude about partisan speak. She said, you are not allowed to use the word Democrat or Republican in this campaign. This is not about making it easier for Democrats to win or to make it easier for Republicans to win. It's nothing to do with that. It's about making our democracy work better. And that's the way we will talk about it. Um, same thing had happened in Maine. Um, 
uh, in the um, rank choice voting movement. You know, Maine had this three-way race that elected this terrible governor, a, uh, a Tea Party governor, who was very, very, uh, um, uh, very, hate, very much hated by many people in the state. But then in his re-election, once again, there was a three-way race and he won his re-election. And that convinced people in Maine that they needed to look to ranked choice voting. And the movement um, that built that ranked choice voting movement also embraced this ideology of not speaking about the issue in partisan terms. It was about how to make democracy work. It wasn't about how to make sure Democrats don't get defeated or how Republicans don't take over. And, and I think that what those examples demonstrate is that if we can focus on a politics that tries to identify the good in all of us, the good in all of us as, Demo as small d Democrats, people who are part of a democracy and leverage that to, um, to try to build for change, I think there's hope that we can do it. What we know from polling is that, you know, uh, millennials and younger hate political parties. They hate them. Um, they might find themselves as liberals, but they don't want to call themselves Democrats. Um, they just want to call themselves liberals or socialists right. or whatever they want to right. call themselves. And I think we have to take that as a, as a lesson. The parties have convinced people that they are not for the good in America and instead, we have to find a way to make reform that doesn't depend on saying, hey, be a good Democrat, help us beat a bunch of Republicans. It's got to say, hey, be a good citizen, help us make a democracy that, that gives each of us equal access to um, our politics. And there's so much we could do if we adopted that framework. And I think that's the framework that should define everything we're doing. So that's why I was eager to be on your podcast and help as you know with your work as much as I can because that's you know from my understanding exactly mm -hmm. the conception you guys have lived the last number of years and and uh, is is what we should see in every context if we're going to be successful cool well I think that's a fantastic note to end on thanks so much for coming on the podcast and we will definitely be in touch because I think as you mentioned there's a lot of overlap and a lot of work to be done great thank you so much